Praise the Lord. I have a great message for you this morning. It's a real chain breaker. It's a lifeline. And some of you in here today, you need to hear this word. And there's lots of people that aren't here that need to hear this word. So tune your ears in. Before I get going, we're going to receive the offering. It's good to give, isn't it? Come on, it's good to give. It's good to give. Hallelujah. Father, I just thank you that we have an opportunity to give. It's a blessing. <clears throat> it's a blessing. I thank you for this opportunity to worship you with our gifting, our tithes, our offerings. We give to you. We say, use them. Expand your kingdom work. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Use these gifts and offerings, Father, to expand your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here for the first time this morning, you're watching online, and you haven't been following us, we're in a series, a seven-part series. It's been challenging. How many of you have been finding this challenging? And we have 245 people in small groups, and they've all found it challenging. Uh, today is probably going to be one of the most challenging of the series so far. Uh, next week, Pam Stenzel will be here. We're bringing her here from Florida. And she's one of those people that's so well known that you have to go through a broker to get her here. You have to make sure that all the timing fits and all the connections and that you get her just at the right time. And she just happens to be open for next week. We're going to be talking about the cancel culture. She's going to be addressing the issue of Purity, I'm sure that's where she's going to go with it. And uh, I've invited uh, some of the high school students locally, some of the sports teams that I know well. And so what we're going to do is we're going to probably reserve this section right over here for young people and maybe flow over into this section because I, I want them to be right up front where they can see Pam's face. Amen. And I really believe God's going to do something great. She'll challenge you parents as well. It is, she's, she's exciting to listen to. It's, um, it, she's great. Uh, you're going to love her. So make sure you're here. Bring your friends, and especially young people. I'd love to get them, I'd love to pack this place out. And I wish we could have got her for a few more days where we could have had some special um, events with her, but uh, it just didn't work out with her schedule. She's very difficult to get a hold of and to connect with, but we've done that. Um, so I'm going to be talking this morning about uh, the falling away, a tough topic. Um, hang in there till the end because I'm going to throw you a lifeline, but getting there is going to be a bit of a struggle. Um, it was for me in the first service. I feel better now because I've already said it once. <laughs> first service, it, it was tough. It was, it was really hard. It was pretty quiet in here, and I'm sure you're going to find the same here. How many of you remember the song, Slip Sliding Away? Oh, yeah. Paul Simon wrote that. It was real popular. He wrote it in 1975. And it's funny, sometimes when I'm preparing a sermon, a song will come to my head or something or a thought, or, and I'll just kind of follow through with it, and that'll become one of the themes of what I'm doing. So I've titled this sermon, Slip Sliding Away, or The Falling Away. The chorus of the song is real simple. It's easy to sing. I'm going to have all of you sing it with me now. You know I'm kidding, right? Slip sliding away, slip sliding away. You know, the nearer your destination, the more you're slip sliding away. In the song, he pre presents different scenarios of people who are slip sliding away because they're living their life without intention, without purpose, without direction, without clear goals. And because of this, the closer they get to their destination, the more it slip slides away. A slip sliding away means that you're slowly losing something or it's moving away from you, especially when you don't want it to, but you can't prevent it. You just can't stop it. It just has, a, it just has this momentum and it's just moving away from you. Someone said, after 10 years of marriage, I feel like my wife is slip sliding away and I, I don't know what to do about it. I can't seem to stop it. Or how about it's, hard getting old because it seems like my health is slip sliding away. Or how about my children are getting older and I don't see them so much anymore. 
It feels like they're slip sliding away. Or how about this one? My faith, my faith, my faith isn't what it used to be. It feels like it's slip sliding away. There's an interesting verse that comes at the end of the song and it summarizes it. God only knows. God makes his plans. The information's unavailable to mortal man. We work our jobs, we collect our pay, believing we're gliding down the highway when in fact we're slip sliding away. What a picture of the world today, isn't it? Everybody buying a camper, getting a Harley and driving down the highway, believing everything's okay, but in fact life is slip sliding away. Scripture doesn't use the phrase slip sliding away, but it uses the phrase falling away. In fact, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul addresses an issue that the Thessalonican church is having. In the first Thessalonians, he talks about the coming of the Lord, and, and false teachers got in there, and they began to tell the people, uh, you're still here, I can't believe you're still here. I said to Bill Marshall, we were sitting there, I said, Bill, we're the only ones here this morning, just before all of you came in. I said, they're gone, Bill. And we're left behind. And he just looked at me and laughed. He knows better than that, but the church of Thessalonica, they didn't know that. And so they were struggling. They were in panic mode. And so Paul writes to them in 2 Thessalonians to kind of correct the errors that were being taught about this. And here he says in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 to 3, look what he says. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. That's the rapture. That's where that concept comes from. The gathering to him, the rapture. That you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit, a message, or a letter, or a pastor to the effect that the Lord has already come. It doesn't say that, but... I'm just referring to Bill. Don't be disturbed about it. Don't get into panic mode about it. In verse 3, he says, Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Now there's a sequence in that scripture of events that take place before the return of the Lord. I don't want to talk about that this morning. I started to do that in my notes, and I said, no, 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 no. The world would say, that's the second sermon preach one sermon, focus on one, so I'm going to focus on one. And when we talk about Jerusalem at the end of this, and then end times people will probably talk a little bit more about the rapture and the being taken away. This morning, I want to focus on one thing, and that's apostasy. Apostasy, let me define it. First off, that word apostasy is focusing at the church, not the world. That's the first thing you need to know. When he's talking about apostasy, he's talking about apostasy happening in the church. Apostasy is a defection from the true God, the Bible and the Christian faith. It's a rebellion against the truth. It's an abandonment after the truth of the truth after you've known the truth. That's what apostasy is. It's knowing the truth, it's hearing the truth, and abandoning the truth that you knew. That's what he's talking about. Are you with me so far? That's important. The King James Bible translates this word apostasy, the falling away. And so that's what I'm going to refer to from now on. Every time I talk about the falling away or the slipping away or whatever, I'm talking about apostasy. Because you're seeing it happen right now, right in front of you. The truth is people have never been more confused and never been more deceived. We're in the midst of a great apostasy, a great falling away. It's like this. Let me give you an example. 45 years ago, my partner and I were roofing contractors, and we did a lot of hot tar roofing. You know that stinky old hot tar kettle? That was me, stinking up everything around us. And we had ripped off this one roof, and it was a large roof, about 25 feet in the air. Uh, No barriers around it, just a large roof, kind of a low-sloped roof. And we had coated it with hot tar the day before, the night before, and left it that way. Came back the next morning and there was a light film of frost on the roof. Now let me tell you something about frost and fresh mopped hot tar. It is literally slipperier than ice. There is no resistance to it. 
There's resistance when you step on regular ice, but on hot tar, there's no porousness to this product when it's brand new, and so it's slipperier than ice. Well, my partner got the brainy idea of taking a slide across this thing. So he winds up, and he goes running across, and he starts sliding, and he's sliding, and he's going like this, and, and the roof had a real low slope to it, so he figured he'd be okay. All of a sudden, he starts going this way. He starts going down, and he's screaming because he can't stop. Lays down on his belly, his hands out wide like this, toes digging in, fingertips digging in, and he's screaming, I can't stop, I can't stop, I can't stop. Whew, right over the edge. 25 feet to the ground, lands on the railroad tracks, I climb down the ladder. There he is laying there, broke, two broken ribs, broken pelvis. And as I, 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 the thing that strikes me most about that incident is how I felt when I watched him slip slide away. I stood there and I watched him. He was 20 feet away. There was nothing I could do. If I stepped on the frost, I would have gone down with him. If I had a hammer, I could have thrown him a hammer. He could have dug it into the roof. I didn't have anything with me. And I'm watching him. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't stop him. I felt totally helpless as I watched him slide over the edge down to the ground. It was his foolish actions that caused the fall. Foolish actions. If he were here today, he'd laugh and he'd say, yeah, that was me, I did it. It was really dumb. You see, this is the challenge we face today, isn't it? All around us, often we feel helpless to stop someone from falling. Stop someone from being pulled down by the lies that surround them and all the deception that we're seeing. It's difficult. It's difficult because you can warn someone, but you can't stop them. It's like gravity. Something happens in their life and it pulls them over the edge like death of a loved one or discouragement or disappointment or, or delusionment or, or deception. These things begin to pile up and pull them down and then all of a sudden they've slipped, slided away and they're gone just like that. And you couldn't do anything. You felt like you were helpless. One of the strongest warnings in Scripture about falling away is found in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 to 6. Now, we're, I'm going to read this. This is sobering. Uh, this scripture scares me. It's, it's kind of like the scripture where, Jesus, where somebody says to Jesus, Lord, didn't we do this and this and this for you? And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. That's a scary scripture. This is a scary scripture. Listen to what it says. Hebrews 6, verses 4 to 6. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away. It is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put Him to shame. Now here's how I read that scripture. To me it seems clear. If someone has known the truth, they've been enlightened to the truth. That's what enlightenment means. Like the light bulb goes on and the darkness goes and the light bulb comes on, right? If someone has known the truth, if they have walked in it, if they have been partakers of the Holy Spirit, in other words, the spirit of truth who leads us into all truth, that they've been partakers of the Holy Spirit, tasted of the goodness of God and His truth, and seen the power in the ages to come, and they walk away from that. They turn their back on that. They reject that. Scripture says it's impossible to bring them back because they've gone into apostasy. Did you hear that? That's a scary thought. And most people don't want to think about it. They'd rather pull up a blanket over their head and, and be a safe Christian and not think about it. Or some other people uh, develop a theology that dismisses this from happening to an enlightened person, to a person who's partaken of the Holy Spirit, to a believer in Jesus Christ, a follower of Christ, or a disciple of Christ. They say, that can't happen. It's not possible. 
Listen carefully to Jesus' warning of this happening in the last days. Put your ears on and listen carefully. In Matthew 24, verses 4 to 8, you have all of these scriptures in your notes. If you're online and you don't have a set of notes, you can go on our website and the link will be there for the notes. Listen to what Jesus said. He's issuing a warning. He says, Jesus told them, don't let anyone mislead you. For many will come in my name claiming I'm the Messiah and they will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Don't lose your mind. Don't lose your soundness of mind. Don't develop a spirit of fear, but keep your focus. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all this is only the first of birth pains with more to come. In other words, Jesus is saying, look, it's going to be increased before my coming, before I'm delivered into this world, before the baby comes, the birth pains begin to increase. This is only the beginning of it. It's going to become more and more intense. He's issuing a warning about what's coming. And then in Matthew 24, he talks about what happens during that time. And it happens because people panic. It happens because they lose soundness of mind. It happens because they develop a spirit of fear and they start running crazy and running away from Jesus. Matthew 24, verses 9 to 14. Then you'll be arrested. You'll be persecuted and killed. You'll be hated all over the world because you're my followers. And verse 10 says, And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Verse 12, sin will be rampant everywhere, and the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. This tells me that some people are not going to endure to the end. When he says the love of many will grow cold, that word love is agape. That love is found in the church. It's found only in relationship to Jesus Christ. Those who are in relationship with Jesus Christ, many of them will turn away and go into apostasy. They'll be deceived by false prophets that will come up alongside of them and say, oh, this whole Jesus thing, that was, all just, that was all just a farce. Look at what's going on around you. If he loved you, he'd protect you. You wouldn't have to go through any of this kind of stuff, Right? And many will be deceived. Many will be pulled away. Apostle Paul warns Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 3 to 4. He says, For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. So they'll go and find teachers that will tell them what they want to hear. They'll reject the truth. Okay, they've heard the truth, but they'll reject the truth and they'll chase after myths or lies. Now, maybe some of you are sitting in here and you're saying, but pastor, 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 what about John 10? What about John 10 that says that no one can snatch them out of his hands? Now, I like that scripture. Just try to get me away from Jesus. Go right ahead and and you're, he's just hanging on to me for everything he's worth. The all power in heaven and earth. I agree with that. In fact, look what he says in John 10, 27 to 29. My sheep will listen to my voice. Say that with me. My sheep will listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. How do you follow Jesus? By listening to his voice. Amen. I give them eternal life and they'll never perish. Praise the Lord. No one can snatch them away from me, for my Father has given them to me. He is more powerful than anyone else. And no one can snatch them from my Father's hands. I love it. It's true. No one can snatch them from His hands or from the Father's hands, but here's my concern. What if they stop listening to His voice? What if they shut His voice off And they say, I don't want to hear him anymore. I don't want to follow this Jesus anymore. It's been a rough road. I am tired of being a follower. I'm going to go another way on another path. Is it possible that they could do that? Is it possible that they could walk out of his hands and go in another direction? 
Or does he hold them so tightly that they can go nowhere? Or how about Romans 8, 35 to 39? I have people say this to me. What about that one? What about Romans 8? Can anything separate us from the love of God? Can anything separate us from the love of God? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened? Does it mean that Jesus doesn't love you because you're going through hard times and difficult turmoil in your, in your life? Absolutely not. He loves you, he loves you, he loves you. In fact, the writer of Hebrew goes on and says, heavens no, as Scripture says, for your sake we've been killed every day. We're being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ Jesus. In Jesus we have overwhelming victory. And everybody said, Amen. I am convinced, it goes on in verse 38, I am convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love. No matter what happens to you, no matter where you are in life, no matter your future, God loves you, He loves you, He loves you. Nothing can separate you from His love. Amen? Your child turns against you, he spits in your eyeball, you still love him, don't you? And he goes on and he says this, Neither death nor life, angels nor demons, neither fears for today nor worries about tomorrow, neither a spirit of fear, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. I don't think anything can separate you from the love of God. No matter what, God loves you. You know, all of heaven rejoices when one person comes to the knowledge of Christ. It's a a party time in heaven when one person comes. That's the love of God, isn't it? How do you think the heart of the Father feels when one of His children is lost for eternity? Do you think He goes, yay? I think His heart is broken because of His love for you. Because of the choices that you make in this life, that separate you from Christ and push you away. You see, in this scripture, it never mentions you. It never mentions you. Ask yourself, why is it? Is it possible that you, in fact, can walk away from Him, that you can separate yourself from Him by your will and by your actions? Is that possible? Is that possible? Years ago, when I was in India, I was 30 three years old, I was a Christian, I think 34 years old for about a year, over 40 years ago. We were going from village to village and preaching the gospel. It was dark. When I say dark, I mean dark. We were walking through these rice paddies on on these mounds that were built up around us so you could walk around them. And I remember there was water all around and there were there was a line of us. There were people in front of me and people behind me. If I stopped, it would have been like, we all would have been in the water, right? So we just kept on marching. And somebody started a song, I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. And I remember singing that song with all of my heart. And I meant it, and I said, I will never turn back from following Jesus. And to this day, I will never turn back from following Jesus. I will never lose my relationship with Jesus Christ. Oh, it may go up and down like this sometimes, but I will always love Him, and I will always follow Jesus. So for me, that's not an issue. And for you, it shouldn't be an issue. Are you with me? So here's the issue that I have this morning. The issue that I have this morning is, how does this falling away happen? I want to know how it happens, because I figure if I know how it happens, then maybe I can somehow help deal with it, with other people. As I said in the beginning, it can be an untimely death of somebody that you love. And it brings great disappointment in God, and you begin to slide away or fall away. It can be a discouragement because of a broken relationship, maybe in the church, Somebody hurt you or wounded you. You say, I'm never going to go back to church again. Or a broken covenant relationship with a husband or a 
or a wife. That can do it. You don't want to be part of any other covenants. Once in a covenant is enough. Or how about an abuse of a parent? Especially a father. And you come in here and this preacher standing up there. God is a father and he, and he just loves you. And you go, ah, i got to get out of that place. It's all bad memories. And you, and you flee and you run from the church. Or how about disillusionment? I tried and I tried and I tried and I keep failing and I feel like a failure. And every time I go into the church, I feel like I'm reminded of my failures. And so you leave. So you don't have to deal with it because you're disillusioned. And the enemy's whispering in your ear. He's lying to you and he's deceiving you. There's lots of reasons why people choose to leave the church, their faith, and why they walk away from God. But Peter, in 2 Peter, he places much of the blame on deception that comes from false teachers. Listen to what I'm going to say. False teachers will deceive people and lead them away from the cross of Jesus Christ. Teachers have an impact on their disciples or on their students. And so Peter deals with this in 2 Peter. And he talks about the danger of false teachers. Jesus spoke about it, that they're going to come. There'll be more and more false teachers coming at the end times. And so Peter talks about it. Listen to what he says. 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3. He says, But there were also false prophets in Israel. There'll be false teachers among you. They will cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who bought them. In this way, they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. And many will follow their evil teachings and shameful immorality. And because of these teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. You see that? But look what he says in 2 Peter 2, 20-22. He gives a reason for this happening. Something happened to these false teachers that they went that way of heresy and deception. Something happens when a teacher, somebody who knows the truth, separates from the truth and starts to preach and teach heresies. Something happens. Learn to recognize it. Verse 20 he says, For if after they've escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first state. Something happened. What happened? These are people who understood the truth. Uh, they understood the defilement of the world. It says they escaped from the defilement because of their knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But then they went back to the very thing that they escaped from. They went back to the defilement, became entangled in it again. And it says their condition became worse than it was before. So they're living in a worse condition. So we would call them miserable people. How many of you heard the saying, hurting people hurt people? Isn't that true? That true? <clears throat> Verse 21 says, For it would be better for them to not have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy command handed down to them. It has happened to them according to a true proverb, a dog returns to its vomit, and a sow after washing returns to wallowing in the mire. You see, the worst part about false teachers is that in their condition of worseness, or in their condition where they're worse off, they drag other people with them back into the slop and back into the mud and the mire. That's what they do. They gather disciples and take them back with them. Hurting people hurt people. And Peter warns these false teachers. He said, listen, the blackest of darkness is reserved for them. Teachers have a higher accountability than anyone else in the body of Christ. Teachers are highly accountable. And he warns them that if you lead people astray with your teaching, if you lead them out of the truth of the Word of God, then reserved for you is the blackest of darkness. My greatest nightmare is to have somebody come to me and say, Pastor, you knew the truth. Why didn't you tell me? 
Why didn't you tell me? Why did you hold back? Or why didn't you say something? And you knew about it, and, and you never said a word. You just kept it to yourself. How would you like to have one of your children say that to you later on after they've grown up? Mom and Dad, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me? Why, didn't you, why did you hold back? Did you not want to hurt my feelings? What, what's the deal here? Explain to me why didn't you tell me? In Acts chapter 20, verses 29 to 31, you hear the cry of Paul's heart. Listen to what he says. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock even from your own numbered men, will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after themselves. So be on your guard. Be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you, night and day with tears. Do you hear what he's saying? Be on your guard. I'm warning you. Deception is coming. False teachers are coming. Jesus said it. Paul said it. And we're seeing it today. We're seeing apostasy. We're seeing people pulled away from the truth by false teachers who are drawing them away. So where do we go from here? What do we do? How do we deal with this? How do we remain close to the Lord so that this doesn't happen? First and foremost, I think you need to develop a heart of worship. I think that's absolutely essential. A merry heart, a joyful heart is good medicine. Something like that, right? Proverbs says. Sing a song. You know, it's really easy right now to do it with all the technology, isn't it? I figured out the other day how to turn my phone on, hook up my Bluetooth, and play music through my radio. It's on my, on my smartphone. I learned a new word the other day. It's called ludite. Anybody know what the word means? Ludite. Huh? Luddite. What does it mean? Whoa! <laughs> He's an English teacher at UB. Someone who rejects technology wants the old ways instead of the new ways. And it's not Luddite, it's Luddite. Okay. I learned a new word, Luddite. And that, that's how I learned it. I'll, I probably will never forget it. It's Luddite. Luddite. So I'm a Luddite, but I found out through technology that I can take worship with me wherever I want to go. I can put it on a Bluetooth. It's absolutely amazing. You should fill your car, fill your house, house, fill your heart with music and worship. It's good for you. Ephesians 5, verses 18 to 20 says, Do not be drunk with wine, because tonight's the Super Bowl. That, because that will ruin your life and give you a headache and nobody will show up for work tomorrow. <laughs> all, all construction will be canceled tomorrow. Trust me when I say that. <laughs> nobody will show up. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit singing psalms and hymns, spiritual songs among yourself. Make music to the Lord in your hearts. Give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. There it is, right there. You want to keep your life right with the Lord? Be a worshiper. Give Him thanks and give Him praise. Man, fill your heart, fill your house, fill everything with music and worship. And His Word will come out of you. This morning in the first service, there was a young lady there with her husband. I was in Aldi's the other day, and I was having a good time. I was singing, and I was... I didn't have a mask on. Nobody had, well, people had masks on, but there was a lady in front of me and I looked at her and I said, it's so good to see your smile. That's just about how I said it. She says, yours too. And we started talking all the way through the line. We started talking and, and she said something about shopping on Sunday. I said, you really shouldn't shop on Sunday. You really ought to go to church. Oh, I do. I said, oh, really? Where do you go? Da, 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 da. And I said, well, I'm the pastor of Crossroads. Crossroads? Oh, I've always wanted to try that church. I said, why don't you come, make sure you introduce yourself to me, and uh, I'll see you. And her name was Lisa. And I memorized it for 20 minutes so I could remember when I saw her. She showed up this morning with her husband. <laughs> right here in church. She was here. You know why? Because of a joyful heart. I mean, seriously. Here you are in line, and there's this crazy guy behind you. Ah! 
And she says, oh, you're the pastor? Yeah! You know, I said, oh, yeah, there you go. It was really good. So that really makes a difference. Your heart of worship and your attitude. You've got to start there. You've got to be a worshiper. Amen? A lot of the hymns were written so people could sing it. It was the Word of God because you, when you sing something, you remember it. Slip sliding away. You're going to remember that all day. Right? You remember it. So that's why we sing the songs of doctrine and then we preach and we teach the songs because it gets it in our spirit. Second, find shepherds who long to know the heart of God the Father. Jeremiah 3, 15-18 says, Then I'll give you shepherds after my own heart who will lead you with knowledge and understanding. There's lots of shepherds at Crossroads Christian Church. That back building is filled with shepherds. People teaching your children, leading your children with knowledge and understanding. We're very selective who we put in those places of teaching because we know that they're going to teach and they're going to lead after the heart of the Father. That's critical. Jesus said, Jesus said, I came to do the will of the Father. That's what he said. And shepherds after God's own heart will always be seeking the will of the Father and help direct you to answer that question. What is the will of the Father? Number three, resist forming ungodly alliances. This is absolutely critical. All you young people, pay attention to me. Do not form ungodly alliances. It says in the Old Testament, in Exodus 23, 32, when they came out of Egypt, out of bondage, and they came into the Promised Land, the Lord said, Get rid of all the nations that are in that land. Have nothing to do with them. Do not form treaties with them. Do not form alliances with them. Cast them out of your midst. Do not allow your sons and daughters to marry with them because if you do, they'll become a snare and they will pull them away from me. Somebody say, Amen. Isaiah 30, verses 1 to 8 says, Woe to you, obstinate children. There you go. How many of you have obstinate children? How many of you are obstinate children? You think, you know what? I can form an ungodly alliance and I'll be okay. I can go in partnership with somebody who's a God-hater and I'll be okay. Listen to me. It doesn't work that way even a little bit. In fact, Scripture says that you should not be unequally yoked. Unequally yoked. Put that picture up. You know what a yoke is? That's a yoke. Right? You look at those oxen, they're both about the same size, right? If one was littler than the other, if one was a donkey, what direction would they go in? They go right around in circles. If you get unequally yoked, that's what your life is going to be. You are going to go around in circles. A flat tire on the front of your car will make you go to the right. A flat tire on the left of your car will make you go to the left. It will control your life. Before you hook up with somebody, stick your head in that yoke and stick their head in the other yoke and says, where's this going to lead me? What do you think of that, huh? Where is it going to lead me? Uh, Sometimes when I meet with young people and they want to get married and after their first discussion with me, they don't like me very much (laughs) because I think they're unequally yoked. Sometimes I'll share things like that and they don't come back and they don't think I'm very nice. Sometimes it's not nice to be not nice. Do you know what I'm saying? Which leads me to my next point. This is, a, this is important. Listen to me. Speak the love and truth. Say that with me. Speak the love and truth. Sometimes love can be very, very confrontational. Sometimes love can be not so nice. Isn't that true? Have you ever had your child say to you, I don't like you. You're not very nice. And you look at them and say, I'm not trying to be nice. I'm your parent. I'm not your friend. So I'm not called to be nice. I'm called to direct you in truth. Sometimes Jesus wasn't very nice. Look what he said to the Pharisees. You brood of vipers. You snakes. You whitewashed tombs. That's not very nice. And sometimes when you speak the truth and love, it can be confrontational. Paul said something interesting in Galatians 6.16. I I have become your enemy because I've spoken to you the truth. If you speak the truth in love, it could happen to you. Finally, keep yourself accountable. Keep yourself accountable. You know, I noticed something about this whole pandemic thing. People that went through the pandemic connected to the church 
went through it differently than people who were not connected to the church. Did you notice that? Why is that? Because of accountability. Uh, scripture says in Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpens iron as one man sharpens another or a friend sharpens a friend. 